how many choices do you make each day? 500? 5,000? From the moment you wake up till the time you go to sleep, you're constantly making decisions. What to wear, what to eat, what to say, where to go, what to think, and what to do. Psychologists estimate that American adults make about 35,000 decisions each day. Some of these choices don't matter much. Choosing an apple over an orange or black socks instead of white socks won't make much of a difference in your future. But the other choices profoundly impact your life and health. After all, we create our own realities by the choices we make. In many ways, you are the sum total of all the decisions you've ever made. Those decisions, good and bad, have literally made you the person you are. The good news is that regardless of your current situation, you can use your power of choice to change your reality for the better. Let's talk about choice as it relates to temperance. Temperance sounds like an old-fashioned word. Most people associate it with the prohibition movement in the early 1900s when alcohol became illegal throughout the United States. But temperance isn't an event. It's a principle. The dictionary defines temperance as self-restraint in the face of misled desire. Where do our misled desires come from? We live in a culture that constantly encourages us to indulge in things that provide instant gratification. Every day we're bombarded with enticing advertisements. If it tastes good, eat it. If you want it, buy it. If it feels good, do it. The problem is that what we want isn't always what we need. If we follow all our desires, it won't take long to end up in a big mess. This is called impulsivity, and it's the opposite of temperance. Impulsivity leads us to make choices without exercising restraint. These choices often hurt us. C.S. Lewis once said, for any happiness, even in this world, quite a lot of restraint is going to be necessary. Every sane and civilized person must have some set of principles by which they choose to reject some of their desires and to permit others. Temperance, restraint. When we think of these words the wrong way, they can sound so confining, but they're actually liberating. The important thing to remember is that every no choice is actually a yes choice. Every time you practice self-control and say no to a misled desire, you're instead choosing something that will give you more happiness in the long run. You're choosing something better, Temperance is all about making the best decisions and experiencing the best outcomes. But how does this apply to real life? Do today what tomorrow you wish you would have done today. If what you do today makes you feel better about yourself tomorrow, you're on the right track. Think about the 35,000 choices you make each day. Many of them are related to your health. How can you make temperate health choices? Let's look at a few examples. Turning off the TV to go to sleep on time. Eating a piece of fruit for dessert instead of a brownie. Drinking water instead of soda. Walking after a meal instead of sitting. Avoiding tobacco, alcohol, and other harmful substances. Each of these choices involve giving something up. But they also result in obtaining something better. Your job is to focus on the something better part. What's better about going to sleep on time instead of staying up to watch TV? Well, the next day you'll have more energy and will be more productive. You'll be more likely to wake up early and start the day off right. That sounds pretty good, right? What's better about walking after meals instead of sitting? If you sit, you'll lose your chance to lower your after meal blood sugar spike. But if you get up and take a walk after you eat, you'll jumpstart your digestion, lower your blood sugar, and prevent that food coma. That sounds a lot better, doesn't it? As you make health decisions throughout the day, I encourage you to choose something better. Focus on how you want to feel in the long run. Be kind to your health. Take care of yourself. Choose to channel those 35,000 choices into the best reality possible.
The Beatles' popular song, Here Comes the Sun, celebrates the warmth and happiness that sunshine brings to life. But not only does sunshine keep us warm, it also fights a variety of diseases, including diabetes. Regular sun exposure is a key component to a healthy lifestyle. One reason why the sun is so important is that it triggers our bodies to produce vitamin D. Few people realize the vital importance of having optimal vitamin D levels. Chances are you've never heard of a connection between vitamin D and diabetes, but research suggests that people with optimal vitamin D levels are 40% less likely to develop type 2 diabetes than those with low levels. In addition to helping prevent diabetes, vitamin D can improve the condition if it already exists, reducing the risk of many diabetes-related complications. But the benefits of vitamin D reach far beyond diabetes. This nutrient impacts nearly every aspect of health. Research shows that people with adequate D levels are far less likely to suffer from a variety of diseases, including heart disease, stroke, some forms of cancer, obesity, kidney disease, colds and flus, bacterial infections, osteoporosis, autoimmune disease, and much more. It seems too good to be true. How could one nutrient impact our health in so many ways? How can it reduce the risk of that many different illnesses? In order to answer this question, we need to understand how vitamin D works. The human body contains about 20,000 different genes. These genes influence every aspect of health, giving the body all the information it needs to function. Vitamin D plays a major role in how genes express information. In fact, a study in 2005 showed that more than 900 of the body's 20,000 genes are directly regulated by vitamin D. If vitamin D levels are high enough, these genes will function properly. But if levels are low, gene expression will be diminished. That explains why vitamin D impacts so many aspects of health. Vitamin D has been described as the key that unlocks the genetic library. It gives the body access to the information it needs to fight disease. But despite the many health benefits of vitamin D, few people realize its importance. In fact, at least 77% of Americans are vitamin D deficient. Most likely, you are too. But the good news is there is something you can do about it. Optimizing your vitamin D level is one of the easiest and yet most valuable contributions you can make to your health. The first step is to get tested. It's the only way to know your baseline level and evaluate your progress. Ask your doctor to order the 25-hydroxy vitamin D test. This test measures the storage form of vitamin D in your blood. You can also order an in-home test kit and mail a small blood sample to the lab. The results will be mailed back to you. Current lab guidelines for vitamin D state that any level between 30 and 100 nanograms per milliliter is normal. However, these guidelines are outdated. Although a level of 30 is high enough to prevent rickets and osteoporosis, it won't prevent many of the other diseases previously mentioned. Many vitamin D experts believe that a much safer guideline is a level between 50 and 100 nanograms per milliliter. This will lower overall disease risk. If your level is low, don't get discouraged. There are two simple ways to bring it up. The first is sunlight. Your skin manufactures vitamin D when it's exposed to the sun. You can produce 15,000 units of vitamin D in just 10 to 20 minutes of direct sun exposure. The problem is there are several challenges that prevent adequate vitamin D synthesis. First, this synthesis only occurs towards the middle of the day when the sun is at least 45 degrees above the horizon. Why is this? There are two forms of ultraviolet light, UVB rays and UVA rays. UVB rays stimulate the skin to make vitamin D, but UVA rays do not. UVB rays are only available around the middle of the day. One tool to determine whether you're producing vitamin D from the sun is to pay attention to the sun shadow standard. If your shadow is longer than you are, you're not producing vitamin D. 
If it's shorter, you are producing it. Unfortunately, many of us don't have the luxury of being outside during this optimal time. The second challenge is that in many locations, especially those north of Atlanta, Georgia, it's only possible to produce vitamin D during the summer months. Levels can dramatically drop during the other seasons. The third challenge is that a large portion of the skin needs to be exposed to the sun in order for optimal synthesis to occur. Getting a little sun on your face or hands isn't usually sufficient. The fourth challenge is that you can wash vitamin D off of your skin. It can take up to 48 hours for vitamin D to completely absorb into your bloodstream. If you take a shower right after being in the sun, you can lose your hard-earned vitamin D. Because of these challenges, very few people are able to optimize their vitamin D levels through sunshine alone. Most people need supplementation. I've worked for the past seven years in sunny California and before that on the warm sunny island of Guam. Even though most of my clients have had lots of sun exposure, the majority of them have low vitamin D levels without supplementation. Vitamin D supplements are a safe and inexpensive way to improve your health. You can purchase vitamin D at your local pharmacy or health food store. How much vitamin D do you need? However much it takes to get your blood level somewhere between 50 and 100 nanograms per milliliter. This amount varies from person to person, and that's why testing is important. The official recommendation for vitamin D is 600 units per day for people age 1 to 70 and 800 units for people over 70. Unfortunately, these recommendations are only designed to prevent rickets and osteoporosis. Many vitamin D experts suggest much higher recommendations. If you came to my clinic with a low vitamin D level, I would start you on 10,000 units per day. After two to three months, I would test you again. If your level was above 80, I would cut you back to a maintenance dose of 6,000 units per day if you're male and 5,000 units per day if you're female. It usually takes four to five months to optimize your vitamin D levels. After that, it's still important to test at least twice each year in the fall when levels are the highest and in the spring when levels are the lowest. As you test, you'll discover how much vitamin D you need to keep levels stable all year round. The good news is that vitamin D toxicity is extremely rare and would require prolonged periods of much higher doses to occur. What about getting vitamin D through food? Unfortunately, it's virtually impossible to optimize D levels this way. Foods like fish, shiitake mushrooms, and liver do have some vitamin D, but in low levels. Fortified milk has vitamin D also, but at very low levels. Unless you frequently eat huge amounts of these foods, which wouldn't be very healthy, they won't provide you with enough vitamin D. I'll share another vitamin D secret that's been valuable for myself and my family. If you feel like you're coming down with a cold or a flu, you can take an extra large dose of vitamin D to boost your immune system. For adults, I recommend taking 50,000 units twice daily for three to five days. There's a good chance this will prevent you from getting sick or help you recover quickly if you're already sick. Children can also take a large dose for three days, but it shouldn't exceed 1,000 units daily per pound body weight. Vitamin D is a powerful nutrient. But sunshine has many other health benefits that aren't related to vitamin D. The fact that you can't get all your vitamin D from the sun doesn't mean you don't need regular sunshine. Other sunshine benefits include improved sleep, enhanced mood, reduced stress, improved digestion, increased metabolism, and a reduced heart rate. Many people are afraid of the sun because they don't want to get skin cancer. However, Studies have shown that prudent sun exposure actually decreases your risk of melanoma. You don't want to get sunburned or overdo it, but the benefits of safe sun exposure definitely outweigh the risk. I recommend getting 15 or 20 minutes of direct sunlight each day. 
work your way up gradually and don't burn yourself. But whatever you do, don't miss out on the many benefits that sunshine brings. Have you ever heard the saying, what you don't know can't hurt you? It would be nice if that were true, but unfortunately it's not. There are plenty of things that can hurt you, whether you're aware of them or not. If you're unaware that your car is running out of gas, it will still stop, despite your ignorance. If you're allergic to peanut butter and you eat a cookie not realizing it has peanut butter in it, you'll still have an allergic reaction. And if you're unaware that your blood sugars are high, they will still damage your body. Despite what we'd like to think, ignorance is not bliss, at least not in the long run. True health and happiness come from accepting reality and making choices to improve it. Sometimes people refuse to have their health testing done because they don't want to know what's wrong. This may help explain why almost 40% of diabetes cases and many more pre-diabetes cases are undiagnosed. But by taking advantage of blood sugar testing, it's possible to identify the problem and change it. When I sit down with clients who are newly diagnosed with diabetes or pre-diabetes, I begin by telling them that the diagnosis is good news. This usually catches them off guard. What do you mean good news, they say? This is terrible. I have a serious health problem. It is serious, I say. And I'm sorry this is difficult for you, but what I've found is that one of the best ways for someone to improve their health is to get diagnosed with a chronic disease and then do something about it. That's why testing is valuable. Don't be afraid to test. Knowledge is power. In this section, I'll outline the various tests available to identify diabetes and prediabetes. Who should be tested? You. If you're over 45 or have any of the risk factors mentioned in the previous video, you need to be tested. Even if you're younger than that and don't have any known factors, I still recommend testing. Many young and apparently healthy people are surprised to learn they have blood sugar problems. When it comes to testing, it's better to be safe than sorry. So take advantage of the following five tests. The fasting blood glucose test is the most common test used to diagnose diabetes. It's taken after you haven't eaten for 12 or more hours. Usually it's taken in the morning before breakfast. You can get your fasting blood glucose checked by your doctor or check it yourself at home if you have a blood sugar monitor. A fasting glucose of 126 or higher indicates that diabetes is present. If you test at this level, your doctor will confirm the result with another test and you will be diagnosed with diabetes. Pre-diabetes can be diagnosed by fasting glucose between 100 and 125. Remember, pre-diabetes alone significantly increases risk of heart disease. If you have pre-diabetes, it's time to take action. By current standards, a fasting blood sugar between 70 and 99 is considered normal. However, the lower end of this range is much healthier. I'll discuss this further in the next video. The random blood glucose test measures the blood sugar at any time during the day. You don't have to be fasting to take it. A random blood sugar of 200 or higher accompanied by classic diabetic symptoms means that diabetes is present. The glucose tolerance test is the most accurate way to detect diabetes, prediabetes, or any blood sugar problem. This is a stress test that shows how the body responds to a sugar load. Sometimes the glucose tolerance test picks up on a blood sugar problem that the other tests fail to recognize. Blood sugars constantly change throughout the day depending on meal timing, exercise, and other factors. A fasting or random blood sugar could at times show up as normal even in a diabetic person. 
The glucose tolerance test measures how the body responds to sugar over a two to four hour time period. To get this test, set up an appointment with your doctor or at a local clinic. You will begin the test after fasting for at least eight hours. First, your fasting blood sugar will be taken. Then you will be given a glucola drink, a syrupy sweet drink containing 75 grams of glucose. Your blood sugar will then be taken at several different times after you finish the drink to track how your body responds to a glucose load. This test will show how your body naturally responds to glucose found in foods. If two hours after drinking the drink, your blood sugar is 200 or higher, this indicates diabetes. A blood sugar of 140 to 199 is prediabetes. It's also valuable to know the one hour level, the blood sugar reading one hour after drinking the glucose drink. This mimics blood sugar levels after a meal. Usually blood sugars are highest 45 minutes to an hour after eating. Sometimes people's two hour levels are normal while their one hour levels are not. Research shows that having a blood sugar of 155 or higher one hour after drinking a glucola drink is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. The Pepsi Jelly Bean Challenge. I've had many clients who were skeptical about the results from the glucose tolerance test. Well, of course my blood sugar was high, they would say. It's because I drank all that glucose. I never consumed that much sugar in real life. When this happens, I ask them to take what I call the Pepsi Jelly Bean Challenge. You can try it too. Here's what you need. Pick your favorite soda or juice and your favorite starchy snack, cookies, crackers, or even pasta or pancakes. Make sure you have 75 to 100 grams of sugar or carbohydrate in the snack. The majority of the calories should come from carbohydrate, not protein or fat. You will also need a blood sugar testing kit. Once you have all the supplies, you're ready to start. Here's what to do next. Wait at least three or four hours after eating a meal, then record your blood sugar. This will serve as your fasting blood sugar. Eat your snacks and drink your juice or soda. After one hour, check and record your blood sugar level. After two hours, check and record again. You can then compare your fasting, one hour and two hour levels to the blood sugar criteria I explained when I discussed the glucose tolerance test. This should give you a good idea as to whether or not your blood sugars are compromised. The hemoglobin A1C is a unique test. It can measure your average blood sugar control for the past two to four months. Your red blood cells have a protein in them called hemoglobin. High blood sugars stick to this hemoglobin protein. Because red blood cells live about 120 days, by measuring the amount of sugar buildup on the hemoglobin, it's possible to evaluate blood sugar control for the past few months. Here are the criteria for evaluating your hemoglobin A1C level. If your hemoglobin A1C is 6.5% or higher, you have diabetes. If your hemoglobin A1C is between 5.7 and 6.4%, you have prediabetes. Normal levels are typically considered somewhere between 4.5 and 5.6%. However, an optimal level, and this is a level for somebody without diabetes, would ideally be about 5% or maybe a little bit less. If you have diabetes or prediabetes, it's very important to evaluate your hemoglobin A1C regularly, typically every three months. So there you have it, the five blood sugar tests. You can get started by buying a home testing kit at your local pharmacy or by visiting your doctor. Don't be afraid to start out small. 
you don't have to do all these tests at once, but each one provides valuable information. Remember, knowledge is power. Just because your blood sugars are high doesn't mean they have to stay high. Testing is only the beginning of the healing process. I encourage you to take the advice of one of my favorite authors, Norman Cousins, a man who battled the chronic disease and won. His challenges don't deny the diagnosis, defy the verdict. Research shows that the more time we spend raising our heart rates through exercise, the longer our hearts will end up beating. Did you know that every hour of aerobic exercise may add two to three hours to your lifespan? Aerobic exercise includes activities like brisk walking, jogging, hiking, biking, and swimming. It involves continuous movement of your large muscle groups and increases your heart rate and need for oxygen. In the last video, we talked about the benefits of after-meal exercise. Once you've added that into your schedule, it's also important to start an aerobic exercise plan. This more vigorous form of exercise has a host of health benefits. It lowers blood sugars, strengthens the heart, burns fat, lowers triglycerides, boosts energy, reduces disease risk, improves mood, and increases longevity. How can you benefit from aerobic exercise? First, find an activity you enjoy, or at least that you can tolerate. I really like playing basketball with my friends and walking with my wife, but you need to choose what works best for you. Second, set aside the time. A good goal is to build up to 45 minutes of aerobic exercise at least three to five times each week. This should be in addition to your after meal exercise, but it's okay to start out small and work your way up. You can even start with just five or 10 minutes each day. It's best to do aerobic exercise before breakfast or a few hours after eating. How intense should aerobic exercise be? You want to get your heart beating and your skin sweaty, and you want to be a little bit out of breath, but don't exercise to the point of pain, exhaustion, or collapse. An easy way to exercise at the right intensity is to pay attention to your voice. You should be able to talk fairly comfortably, but you shouldn't be able to whistle or sing. I encourage you to take advantage of the many benefits of aerobic exercise. It won't take long to notice a big improvement in how you feel. Strength training is also a powerful tool to control blood sugars and improve health. This exercise strengthens the body's major muscle groups. Muscles much more metabolically active than fat. The more you use your muscles, the more glucose they will need. This naturally reduces insulin resistance and lowers blood sugars. Research shows that diabetics who participate in strength training and aerobic exercise have lower hemoglobin A1C levels than those who only do one or the other. Not only does strength training improve blood sugars and boost metabolism, it also strengthens the bones, improves posture and balance, and prevents age-related mobility problems. Once you're successfully walking after your meals and getting aerobic exercise, you may want to add strength training. A good goal is 20 minutes of strength training two or three times each week. Your muscles need time to rest, so don't do this more often than every other day. Strength training can involve weights, bands, or just exercises that use the weight of your own body. You can buy dumbbells or bands to use at home, or may want to join a gym, work with a personal trainer, or get a strength training workout video to help. The final type of exercise we'll discuss is intermittent training, or IT. I only recommend IT if you've already been doing the other three types of exercise for at least a month or two. You can do IT exercise at the same time you do aerobic exercise by alternating short bursts of intense physical activity with intervals of lighter activity. For example, you might run as fast as you can for 30 seconds and then walk slowly for 90 seconds, repeating the cycle several times. IT exercise boosts the metabolism and helps the body to burn more fat.
It also increases the secretion of growth hormone, which makes the body more toned and lean. IT can also lower triglycerides and improve thyroid function. If you decide to do IT, start out slow. Add it into your regular aerobic exercise routine one or two times per week and start out with just one or two sets of 30 and 90 seconds. You can gradually build up to eight sets two or three times each week. And there you have it, the four types of exercise. After meal, aerobic, strength training, and IT. Don't be afraid to start out small. Go for a walk after you eat. The best type of exercise is the kind you actually do. If you have time to include all the types into your schedule, great. You'll experience fantastic results. If not, do what you can. Every choice adds up. I'd like to close by sharing three tips that will help you stay active for good. First, find a fitness buddy. If you need extra motivation to get moving, try the buddy system. Find a walking partner or someone to go to the gym with. It's really motivating to have someone else encouraging you and counting on your support. Second, be consistent. You won't truly benefit from exercise unless you do it regularly. You can't make up for a week without exercise by working out extra long on the weekend. You need to benefit from activity every day. And third, enjoy yourself. Choose activities you like or find ways to make exercise more fun, like listening to music or walking in a beautiful setting. You're more likely to stick with something if you enjoy it. By now, I hope you feel encouraged to get moving and stay moving. I know you can do it. Remember, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The food choices you make each day don't just impact your own health. They affect the environment, animals, and other people. Let's take a closer look at how a plant-based diet can make the world a better place. Did you know that raising animals for food can be extremely harmful to the environment? It takes far more natural resources to produce animal products than it does to produce plant food. Why is this? If I just sit in bed all day, I'll still burn about 1,500 calories. This is called my resting metabolic rate, and it's the amount of energy used just to keep me alive. Animals have resting metabolic rates too. Most of the calories fed to meat animals are just used to keep those animals alive. In fact, it takes 20 calories going into an animal just to get one calorie of flesh back out. This is a very inefficient system because it takes massive amounts of land, water, and other resources 
to feed the animal that then becomes our food. The majority of the agricultural land in the United States is used to grow crops that feed animals. It takes 20 times the amount of fossil fuels, 14 times the amount of water, and 25 times as much land to produce one meat calorie as it does to produce one plant calorie. Dairy products are also very inefficient. In 2006, a group of United Nations scientists released a report called Livestock's Long Shadow, which examined the environmental impact of meat production. The report stated that eating meat is one of the most significant contributors to the most serious environmental problems at every scale, from local to global. The meat industry contributes to problems of land degradation, climate change and air pollution, water shortage and water pollution, and loss of biodiversity. Meat consumption is the number one cause of global warming. It contributes to global warming 40% more than all forms of transportation combined. The factory farming industry places an enormous strain on natural resources. The huge amount of animal waste created by confining so many animals in such a small place pollutes the water, air, and land. If you're concerned about the environment, the best way to reduce your footprint is to eat plant-based. So why aren't environmental organizations shouting this from their rooftops? They urge us to use less water, recycle compost, and drive more fuel-efficient cars. Sometimes they mention eating local, but seldom do they ever utter a word about reducing meat consumption. Yet a 2008 award-winning study found that Eating 100% plant-based just one day a week reduces greenhouse gas emissions more than eating 100% local seven days a week. Unfortunately, sometimes politics get in the way of proper environmental education. But the environmental impact of meat and dairy consumption is no small matter. According to Dr. Pachuri, the chair of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a major shift towards plant-based diets is imperative if we are to have even a chance of preventing catastrophe. So what about animals? Every year in North America, we slaughter about 11 billion land animals for food. When we go to the grocery store, we often see meat and dairy products with pictures of happy animals on the packaging, creating the illusion that cows, pigs, and chickens are raised on the old McDonald-type family farms that we grew up singing about. Unfortunately, this isn't the farm of the 21st century. These traditional establishments have been replaced by factory farms, otherwise known as concentrated animal feeding operations. Over 90% of our nation's food animals are raised under these conditions. Factory farms are much more concerned with their bottom line than they are with animal welfare. They have essentially transformed animals into production units with the goal of generating the greatest amount of meat for the least amount of money. The most efficient way to accomplish this task is to raise animals in confined spaces. Chickens raised for meat are selectively bred and fed to grow much larger and faster than is natural. Because of the popularity of white breast meat, these birds are selectively bred so their upper bodies grow six times faster than would be normal. Their internal organs can't possibly keep up with this growth, so many die from lung or heart failure. Because their legs can't support the weight of their bodies, many become crippled and die of starvation or dehydration. 
But chickens used for eggs may suffer even more. 95% of these birds spend their entire lives crammed into tiny cages, unable to spread their wings. At a young age, their beaks are seared off with a hot blade in order to prevent them from pecking one another to death. The beak is full of nerves, and de-beaking is extremely painful. Many of the hens suffer broken legs as a result of being confined in such close quarters. It takes 34 hours in this miserable cage for a hen to produce just one egg. Sometimes hens are starved for up to two weeks in order to shock their bodies to produce more eggs than is natural. Cows bred for meat are separated from their mothers soon after birth and are painfully castrated, branded, and dehorned. They soon move from pastures to feedlots to be fattened up on a very unnatural diet. They then endure long and stressful trips to slaughterhouses, which are often very far away. During these trips, they may go without food and water for days. Cows used for dairy also experience immense suffering. In order to produce milk, they have to be artificially inseminated and impregnated over and over again. They commonly endure extremely traumatic separation from their calves within a day of birth. These cows are forced to produce about six times as much milk as their babies would naturally suckle. This is extremely damaging to their health. One-fourth of all dairy cows at any given time have mastitis, a very painful swelling of the glands in their udders. The excess milk production also leaches calcium from the cow's bones, causing osteoporosis and fractures. This explains why 40% of dairy cows become lame by the time they're shipped to slaughter. There's not enough time to describe the suffering of every animal, but pigs, turkeys, sheep, and other animals used for meat often live miserable lives and die painful deaths. Line speeds at slaughterhouses have increased exponentially over the years, increasing trauma and injury to animals and to workers. In some cases, animals are disassembled while fully conscious. But in addition to harming the environment and animals, meat production also harms people. Close to one billion people worldwide don't have enough food to eat. This number is expected to grow much larger in coming years. According to the United Nations, global food production needs to increase 75% by the year 2050 in order to keep up with the world's surging population. By this time, an estimated 9.3 billion people will inhabit this planet. If all of these people consume the diet of the average American today, experts estimate that we would need four planet Earths to sustain the population. For example, many people in Mexico are chronically undernourished, but much of the grain produced in that country goes to feed livestock for meat. In Brazil, much of the cultivated land is used to grow soybeans that are exported to feed livestock. Huge amounts of the Amazon rainforest have been destroyed to raise livestock and produce soybeans to feed them. As a result, many local farmers and communities have been pushed off the land. Prices for black beans and other staples of the traditional Brazilian diet have skyrocketed. It's true that world hunger is multifaceted and is also affected by social and political factors. But there's no doubt that plant-based eating is part of the solution for change. The average American gets 27% of their calories from animal products. 
if everyone on Earth started eating this way, more than half of the world's population would starve. Paul McCartney, a longtime vegetarian, uses his influence to promote plant-based eating. Let's listen to what he says about the potential that plant-based eating has to change the world. It's staggering when you think about it. Vegetarianism takes care of so many things in one shot. Ecology, famine, and cruelty. The world is a big place, and sometimes it feels like we're too small to make a difference. But change happens one person at a time, one meal at a time, and one bite at a time. As you strive to improve your health through a plant-based diet, you can celebrate the fact that the benefits extend far beyond yourself to other people, to animals, and to the entire planet. You will quite simply be making this world a better place. Have you ever run out of gas? It's a terrible feeling. One moment you're driving along without a care in the world, the next moment your car sputters, slows down, and finally grinds to a halt. It all happens so quickly. Or does it? How long does it take to run out of gas? 10 seconds? 30 seconds? It's actually quite gradual. You begin running out of gas the moment you start driving on a full tank. Drop by drop and gallon by gallon, your car burns fuel. You reach half a tank, then a quarter of a tank, and then an eighth. Eventually, the fuel light comes on. Even after that, it still takes some time to completely run out of gas. And that's what a gas gauge is for. It lets you know where you're at on the fuel spectrum and how to make decisions accordingly. You can only run out of gas one drop at a time. Sometimes a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes comes suddenly and unexpectedly. One day you're living life as you know it. The next day your doctor tells you you're in trouble. How can your health status change so quickly? Just like running out of gas takes time, developing pre-diabetes or diabetes is a gradual process. And just like a gas gauge helps you monitor your fuel status, the five stages of high blood sugar can help you monitor your health. Most people don't realize that by the time blood sugars become high enough to be diagnosed as diabetes or pre-diabetes, a metabolic problem has been underway for quite some time. Blood sugars aren't just high or normal. There's a spectrum. Different levels mean different things. That's why it's important to understand the five stages of high blood sugar. When I lived on the island of Guam, I was asked by the governor to work with a team to address the island's diabetes epidemic. At that time, Guam had five times more diabetes-related deaths than the U.S. mainland did. The governor wanted to focus on preventing diabetes through lifestyle education. While working on this project, I developed the five stages of high blood sugar. This tool can help identify the earliest stages of a blood sugar problem before prediabetes or diabetes even exists. Let's look at the stages now. This chart can help you understand your risk. In order to use it, you need to check your blood sugars while fasting and also one and two hours after eating. Then use this chart to identify what stage of blood sugar you're in. If your blood sugars are in the optimal range without taking any medication, you're in luck. Maintaining optimal blood sugars greatly reduces your risk of disease. But even if your blood sugars are healthy, Keep watching the videos in this course. The information can benefit your health in many other ways and can prevent you from developing a blood sugar problem in the future. Stage one of high blood sugar represents the beginning of risk. If you're at this stage, you're already becoming resistant to insulin. 
It would be a good idea to undergo a glucose tolerance test to get a better idea of your overall blood sugar control. The good news is that stage one is the easiest stage to reverse. By taking aggressive action, you can bring your blood sugars back into optimal range. Stage two high blood sugar is a little more risky. It means that you're getting close to a pre-diabetic state. In fact, many people with stage two blood sugar may be diagnosed with pre-diabetes or diabetes after taking a glucose tolerance test. If you're in this stage, make sure to take advantage of all the testing outlined in the previous video, especially the glucose tolerance test. Don't put it off. If you're careful to follow the healthy habits outlined in this course, you can reverse the problem before it gets worse. Stage three high blood sugar is the early phase of prediabetes. It's defined by a fasting glucose of 100 up to 109, or a two hour blood sugar of 140 to 159. Even the early phase of prediabetes is dangerous business. It at least doubles your risk of heart disease, whether or not it ever progresses to full-blown diabetes. If you have prediabetes, it's crucial to address the condition immediately through comprehensive testing, lifestyle intervention, and close collaboration with your doctor. Stage four high blood sugar is advanced prediabetes. If you're in this stage, you're just a few blood sugar points away from full-blown diabetes. You're also at a dramatically increased risk for heart disease. Stage four is an urgent call to begin reversing the condition before it becomes full-blown diabetes or before you have a cardiovascular event. Make sure to take a glucose tolerance test. Work closely with your doctor and develop an aggressive lifestyle plan. The fifth stage of high blood sugar is diabetes. It can be diagnosed with a fasting blood sugar of 126 or higher, or a two hour glucose tolerance blood sugar of 200 or higher. Once you've developed type two diabetes, your risk dramatically increases. Not only are you in danger of a heart attack or stroke, you're also at risk for other diabetic complications such as kidney disease, vision loss, poor wound healing, nerve damage, amputations, etc. But don't give up. Regardless of what blood sugar stage you're in, there's always hope. While it's ideal to identify and address the problems as early as possible, it's still not too late. A diagnosis of diabetes can be extremely valuable if it motivates you to take action. The good news is that it's possible to move backwards through the five stages of high blood sugar. Chances are you can move from five to four to three to two to one, and even to an optimal blood sugar level, one healthy choice at a time. When I was a little boy, I had lots of big dreams. I wanted to be an astronaut when I grew up to explore the unknown frontiers of space. I also wanted to climb the highest mountains in the world and to hone my physical skills so I could one day do two finger push-ups and other athletic moves like Bruce Lee. What about you? Can you remember your childhood dreams? One of my favorite things about little kids is their big imaginations. Kids are great at dreaming. That's one reason why childhood is such an adventure. But it seems like the older we get, the less we dream. Reality sets in. We realize that some of our dreams aren't practical. Many of us are doing well just to get through each day. Unfortunately, this mindset can keep us from accomplishing things we might be able to do if we were still brave enough to dream. One of my favorite quotes says, you're never too old to set a new goal or to dream a new dream. Through the years, I've noticed that the people who are most successful in reaching their health goals have two things in common. They know how to dream and they know how to do. 
In order to make lasting health changes, we need to know how to set goals or dreams and also how to take practical steps to make those dreams a reality. One of my clients who did this exceptionally well was David. The first time he showed up to my office, he was frantic. I'm losing my mind, doc, he said. I need you to help me. I need some medication. I'm so shaky and nervous. David was a big guy. He was six foot five and 332 pounds. But although he looked macho on the outside, he was suffering on the inside. As I listened to his story, I began to understand why. David was the residential manager of a large exotic resort on Guam. His job was extremely stressful, and his boss was harsh and demanding. David was the only manager who lived on site. After working all day, he would take call all night, frequently waking up for all kinds of requests. But David's hard work never seemed to satisfy his boss. He was constantly criticizing David and questioning his decisions. Several years of this job had literally drained David's physical and emotional health. The last few months had been especially difficult. David was stressed to the max and easily irritated. He confided in me that he had recently become so angry with one of his 400 employees that he almost hit the man. David realized he was extremely close to losing his job and ruining his chances of remaining in the resort industry. But David's real breakthrough had come the night before when his five-year-old daughter had found him sitting at his desk, shaking uncontrollably. She put her little hand on his shoulder then gave him a hug and said, Daddy, I don't want you to die. David realized right then that he couldn't wait any longer. So here he was in my office the next day, desperate to improve his health. David was in luck because two days later, our clinic was starting a six month intensive wellness program. It didn't take much to convince him to join. Before the program started, we ran some tests on David and this is what we found. At 330 pounds, David was obese. His blood pressure, cholesterol, and triglycerides were all high. He had advanced prediabetes, was resistant to insulin, and had a high level of inflammation. David's lab results didn't look pretty. As we sat in my office reviewing the labs, I encouraged David to set some specific goals that would help motivate him throughout the program. Here's what he came up with. First, David wanted to weigh less than 200 pounds. David's second goal was to run the Honolulu Marathon. And his third goal was to become the general manager at a five-star hotel in Maui. To be honest, when I first saw the goals, I wasn't sure if David would succeed. But I could tell he was determined to try. So I encouraged him to give it his best shot. And that's exactly what he did. David was the most dedicated person in the health program. He showed up early to every meeting, took notes, and immediately began applying the information that he learned. David wanted to start training for his marathon. So he started running twice a day, and sometimes he even ran to the class at the clinic. He was also serious about losing weight. When we served our healthy meals, he would fill his plate, but wouldn't return for second or third helpings. The resort where David worked had several gourmet restaurants. For years, he had been able to order anything he wanted at any time, but not anymore. David was determined to stick with his plan. Within just a few days, David could already tell a tremendous difference in his mood and energy level. A week into the program, he came into my office and said, hey, remember how I wanted anti-anxiety meds? Never mind about that. I actually feel great now. 
Two weeks into the program, David had already lost 11 pounds. His cholesterol had dropped 54 points. His triglycerides were normal now. His blood pressure had improved so much, he was able to stop both of his hypertensive medications. David was excited, but still not satisfied. He had a long way to go. He kept up the hard work, and the results paid off. At the end of this six-month program, he had already lost 79 pounds and was no longer pre-diabetic. I continued to see David for several more months until he felt confident continuing on his own. About 10 months later, I was walking through the Guam airport when I heard someone call my name. I turned around to see David and his family. To be honest, it took me a few seconds to recognize him. He looked like an athlete. Wow, you look great, I said. What's your weight at? David grinned. I broke the 200 pound mark about a month ago. He had lost over 130 pounds in just a year and a half. But that wasn't the only good news. By the way, he said, guess what I did two weekends ago? I ran the Honolulu Marathon and finished. I was so happy for David. I told him I was super proud of him, then asked where he was headed. Well, believe it or not, he said, we're heading to Maui. I'm starting my new job as the general manager at the top resort on the island. I've always remembered David's story and been inspired by his dedication. I've often wished that all my patients could experience such dramatic transformations. How was he able to succeed against such tremendous odds? What was David's secret? Keep watching, because in the next section, I'll unpack David's story a little more and share how you can have similar results as you work to accomplish your goals. In the last section, I told you the story of David, a man who was determined to improve his health. His story can teach us the five steps necessary to set and achieve our goals. We'll look at those now. But first, grab a piece of paper so you can put this information into action. The first step in reaching your goals is to identify your values and how they relate to your health. The dictionary defines values as a person's judgments about what is important in life. David valued his family. The tipping point for his health came when his five-year-old daughter told him she was afraid that he would die. It broke David's heart to realize that his poor health was hurting his family. He knew that improving his health would also improve the quality of his relationships and enable him to be a better husband and father. What do you value most and how does that relate to your health? your family, friends, your career, hobbies, your faith? Have you ever thought about how your health influences all these things? Because you experience your entire life inside your body, improving your health will also improve every aspect of your life and put you in the best possible position to invest in the things that you value the most. Do you have your paper ready? Take a few moments to answer the following questions. What are two or three things that you value the most? How will improving your health impact these things and your ability to experience them? Feel free to pause the video to answer these questions before you move to step two. Once you've identified your values, it's time to set long-term goals. Because David valued his family, he was motivated to set three long-term goals, weighing less than 200 pounds, running the Honolulu Marathon, and becoming the general manager at a resort in Maui. Long-term goals are more specific than values, but require time and effort to reach. You need to set long-term goals that you can get excited about. They should be realistic and attainable, but still challenging. But don't worry, you don't have to run a marathon to get healthy. Other examples of long-term goals might be to no longer fit the blood sugar criteria for diabetes or prediabetes, 
to lower your hemoglobin A1C from, let's say, 10% to 6% in six months, to be able to hike a five-mile trail with your kids. Long-term goals are as individual as people. So pick goals that sound fulfilling to you. Take a few moments to write out a few long-term goals right now. Make them as specific as you can and include a deadline for accomplishing them. Feel free to pause the video before moving to step three. Step three is to set short-term goals that will help you reach your long-term goals. Since David's long-term goal was to run a marathon, he decided to set short-term goals to help him prepare. That's why he started running four days a week. He gradually added miles until eventually he was ready. David also wanted to lose 130 pounds, but he knew it wouldn't happen all at once, so he set short-term goals to lose one or two pounds each week. Now it's your turn. How can you turn your long-term goals into short-term goals? Why not write those goals down now? Be specific about what you want to accomplish, what your deadline is, and how you're going to do it. The fourth step to reach your goals is to turn your short-term goals into daily habits. David's short-term goal to lose one to two pounds per week needed to be broken down even more. That's why he turned his goal into specific habits. He started eating a giant salad each day and eliminated junk food from his diet. He learned to control his portions by eating just one plate of food at each meal instead of going back for second or third helpings. David's short-term goals were becoming more like habits. What about you? How can you turn your goals into daily habits? Take a few moments to write down habits that will help. Keep it simple and specific. Here are a few examples. I will take a 10 to 15 minute walk after each meal this week to prevent blood sugar spikes. We'll talk more about after meal exercise at an upcoming video. Or I will go to sleep by 10 p.m. each night this week. I will skip dessert this week and choose a piece of fresh fruit instead. Take a few minutes to write down specific habits that will help you reach your goals. You can pause the video before moving to step five. The fifth and final step to reach your goals is to just keep going. It's easy to set goals, but it takes persistence and dedication to follow through. Your plan may be to walk five times a week, but you may not always feel like it. Your schedule will get busy. You'll think of a million other things to do. It happens to all of us. In those moments when you're tempted to cheat or throw in the towel, I encourage you to review the things you've written down today. Think about the things you value. Think about how rewarding it will feel to reach your goals. Think about how good you'll feel after following through with a healthy choice. If you make a mistake, don't get discouraged or beat yourself up. Just get back up and keep moving forward. It took David a year and a half to reach his goals, but only a few days to start feeling better. And that's the exciting thing about health. Every day counts. Every choice counts. You don't have to wait a year, a month, or even a week to notice a difference. Healthy choices add up quickly when you just keep going. You may want to watch this video again several times throughout this course. You can adjust your goals and strategies as you learn more health information in the upcoming sessions. But in the meantime, go ahead and get started with the goals you've already set. As the ancient proverb says, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Now that you set both short and long-term health goals, you're ready to roll. But chances are you'll come to a point where you don't feel as motivated as when you first started. This video is for times like that. 
All of us want to live healthy lives, and yet we're all too aware that sometimes our habits don't match up with our goals. It's easy to agree with health information intellectually, but much more difficult to put it into practice. You can probably relate. Have you ever set a health goal but failed to reach it? Why does this happen? I believe the answer is ambivalence. Ambivalence occurs when you have mixed feelings about your health goals. On one hand, you want to make choices to improve your health. But on the other hand, you meet resistance and obstacles. Healthy changes seem out of your reach. If left alone, ambivalence can be a bad thing. But there are simple steps you can take to resolve your ambivalence and achieve your goals. Let me show you how to coach yourself through the process. But first, pause the video to grab a piece of paper so you can take some notes. Step one, affirm your desire to be healthy. You care about your health. If you didn't, you wouldn't be watching this right now. The first step to resolving ambivalence is to affirm your positive desire to be healthy. You can start by writing down several affirming statements such as, my health is valuable to me. I'm investing time and energy into wellness. I want to be healthy for my family. Or I want to be disease free. The next step is to rate your readiness. Pick a health strategy you know you'd like to take advantage of but are having trouble implementing. For example, exercise. On a scale of 0 to 10, identify how ready you are to start exercising. 0 means you're not motivated or interested at all. 10 means you're highly motivated and excited to start. Let's say you decide you're a 5. Don't worry, we can work with that. Now that you've ranked your readiness, you need to explain why you chose the number you did. First of all, why didn't you choose a lower number? If you picked five, why didn't you pick a three or a four? Take some time to think about this and write it out or explain it to someone. Most likely, the reason why you didn't choose a lower number is because part of you is very interested in making a change like exercising. You're aware of the health benefits and you want to experience them. The next question is, why don't you pick a higher number? Why not a 7 or an 8? Take some time to write this down. This will help you identify the obstacles in your way. Maybe you've had a hard time fitting exercise into your schedule. Maybe you've tried before and failed. Maybe you haven't yet found the type of exercise that you enjoy. Explaining your rating will help you identify the ambivalence or mixed feelings you have about whatever health goal you're working on, in this case exercise. Part of you wants to engage in a health behavior, but part of you doesn't. Now that you've identified the thoughts that are causing the ambivalence, you can work to address them. Step four is to resolve the ambivalent thoughts. Write down a few reasons why it's worth it to push through the obstacles that are holding you back. What are some practical things you could do to make this happen? Identify your objections one by one and decide whether they're valid. If your objection to exercising is you don't have enough time, decide whether that's really true. Maybe you don't have time to spend an hour at the gym each day, but could you fit a few short walks into your schedule? Once you've confronted your objections, it's time to take action. Push through the ambivalence. Choose to identify with the part of you that does want to change. You do care about your health. You do want to improve. You can be successful. Embrace the fact that you are a person who wants to be healthy. Believe it and act on it. Step five is to take a baby step. It's true that our actions follow our thoughts, but it's also true that our thoughts follow our actions. Sometimes the most persuasive thing you can do to motivate yourself is to make a tiny health choice and just experience how good it feels. For example, maybe you just need to pause the video and go for a short walk. Notice how you feel when you return. 
Do you have more energy? Do you feel any better? Would you like to feel this way more often? Maybe you are more ready to start exercising than you thought. After all, you already did start. When you're overwhelmed at the idea of a new goal, don't overthink it. Just take a few baby steps in the right direction. You can use these five steps to resolve your ambivalence about all kinds of different habits, exercise, food, or whatever goal you want to achieve. Remember, it's very natural to have mixed feelings about health goals. Part of you wants to change, but part of you is more comfortable doing things the old way. The secret to success is to identify with a part of you that wants to change. Remind yourself that you're valuable, that you care about your health, that you're committed to moving forward. The more you think like a healthy person, the more you'll become a healthy person. I have no doubt that you will succeed. We've talked quite a bit about healing the body, but in this section, I want to focus on the mind. The mind and body are closely connected. Whatever impacts one also affects the other. Reversing diabetes isn't just about protecting your heart, your eyes, or your kidneys. It's also about taking care of your brain, your thoughts, and your feelings. If you want to improve your health, you need to be kind to your mind. An ancient Chinese philosopher once wrote, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Our thoughts and beliefs are powerful. They influence the way we act and the habits we form. That's why it's so important to think good thoughts. Dealing with a health challenge like prediabetes or diabetes can seem overwhelming. You may have felt discouraged in the past when, despite your best efforts, your health didn't seem to improve. I'd like to share some thoughts with you that will give you hope. First of all, I just want to remind you that you're valuable. You're the only you in the entire universe. Your life matters. I'm not sure what your faith background is, but I believe that each one of us was created in the image of a loving God and designed to experience an abundant life. But whether you believe in God or not, I'm sure you'll agree that human life is precious, including yours. Think about the most valuable things you own. You treat them carefully, don't you? The more valuable something is, the more time and energy you want to invest in it. Since you're valuable, your health matters. It makes sense to invest time and energy to take care of yourself. Does it ever seem like an overwhelming challenge to take care of your health? There are so many things to change that you don't even know where to start. I'd like to encourage you with the fact that you may be a lot closer to health than you think. Health isn't just a destination, it's a journey. Every step counts. The important thing is that you're moving in the right direction. You can be healthier today than you were yesterday. You can be healthier tomorrow than you were today. Yes, health provides fantastic long-term benefits, but it also pays off right away. 
When you make healthy choices, you benefit from them immediately. The third encouraging thought I want to leave you with is the fact that healthy choices are doable and sometimes much easier than we think. Many of my clients have had brain blocks to exercising or to eating healthy because they thought they had to do it all at once and do it perfectly. Thankfully, that's not the case. Any health plan that works has to be practical and doable enough to actually fit into your life. If you hate running or going to the gym, then that shouldn't be part of your health plan. Instead, maybe you want to find a walking buddy. You have to make it work for you. It's the same with nutrition. If you don't like cauliflower or Brussels sprouts, I don't want you to have to eat them. Any nutrition plan that works will include foods that you enjoy and know how to make or buy. Don't get discouraged about change by making it seem harder than it actually is. You can have confidence that health is actually within your reach. I hope these thoughts are encouraging. As you move forward in your health journey, it's important to think positively. It's probably very natural for negative thoughts to start filling your mind, like, I can't do this. I've messed up too many times. It's too difficult. Or, I'm just a failure. When these thoughts come up, challenge them and replace them with true thoughts, like, I will keep moving forward. I'm valuable, and so is my health. I fell down, but I'm getting back up. I want to reach my health goals. The ancient King Solomon once wrote, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What a powerful concept. Our thoughts become our realities. As we think like healthy people, we'll continue becoming healthy people. Some people need extra support to stay encouraged and take care of their mental health. And that's perfectly okay. Many people benefit from counseling, especially from cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. This technique will teach you to replace damaging thoughts with healthy thoughts. I encourage any of my clients who are interested to take advantage of CBT counseling. Many studies have shown that people with diabetes have increased rates of depression, and people with depression have increased rates of diabetes. If you're feeling hopeless about your health, I encourage you to be kind to your mind. Talk to a counselor, to your doctor, or to a trusted friend. You don't have to do this alone. The good news is that not only will taking care of your mind benefit your body, but taking care of your body will also benefit your mind. Healthy habits like nutrition, exercise, and sleep provide powerful benefits for emotional health. That gives me hope because at the end of the day, I don't just want your blood sugars to be better. I want you to feel like a million bucks. Nancy was serious about reversing her prediabetes. Halfway through our six-month wellness program, she had experienced dramatic results, lowering her blood sugars, her cholesterol, and her inflammation level. Nancy was determined to continue making progress, but one day my health lecture threw her for a loop. I talked about the healing benefits of love and forgiveness. I shared that resentment and hostility are dangerous risk factors for disease. Then I had Nancy and the other participants fill out a confidential questionnaire to help them determine their levels of anger, hostility, and depression. I could tell Nancy was very troubled when she filled it out. I encouraged the group to do what they could to improve their results. I told them a story about a conflict I had recently had with a colleague. After the argument, we avoided each other for several weeks. The ill feelings were eating away at me. I wanted to make it right, but I was embarrassed. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. I called my friend and apologized. 
I immediately felt better, like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. After telling Nancy's group the story, I challenged them to take care of any unresolved conflict within the next 24 hours. I promised them that even if this was difficult, the health benefits would be well worth it. After the lecture, Nancy came up to me in tears. Her results revealed that she had high levels of anger and hostility, and Nancy knew why. 20 years earlier, Nancy had a major conflict with her next door neighbor, Lisa. She and Lisa had been best friends for years, but then everything went wrong. Lisa said something very critical about Nancy's teenage son. Nancy was so hurt and offended that she told Lisa she never wanted to talk to her again. Lisa became defensive and a giant rift was created. Even though they were next door neighbors, they hadn't spoken for 20 years. When they crossed paths, they would completely ignore each other. Nancy told me she didn't know what to do. I've realized this anger towards her is actually hurting me. But how can I talk to her now? This has gone on for so long. I prayed with Nancy that night and encouraged her to keep thinking and praying about ways to best resolve her problem. The next morning, Nancy met with another neighbor, Tina, for their usual morning walk. Nancy told her story to Tina and admitted how embarrassed she was. They prayed together and then agreed to meet after dinner for another walk. That evening, Nancy heard a knock on her door. When she opened it, she expected just to see Tina, but Tina had brought Lisa along. Overwhelmed with emotion, Nancy looked at Lisa in the face for the first time in 20 years. Both of them teared up. Nancy finally worked up the courage to say, Lisa, I'm so sorry about what happened. But Lisa interrupted Nancy. No, she said, I'm sorry for what I said. I hope we can be friends again. They both reached out and hugged each other and then went for a walk. That same evening, Nancy came to our health meeting and told her story. We could tell that a heavy burden had been lifted from her shoulders. After 20 years of bitterness, she finally felt free. I'll always remember how Nancy explained it to us. She said, I was excited when my cholesterol and my blood sugars came down, but I can tell that resolving this issue has improved my health and sense of well-being more than any other aspect of this program. Nancy's story illustrates a very important health principle. Forgiveness is an essential component of a healthy lifestyle. Resentment is similar to an autoimmune disease. When someone hurts us, our natural response is to harbor bitterness and ill feelings towards them. For some reason, we feel like this will help us make the situation better. But over time, the anger starts to eat away at us. It often harms us more than anyone else. Dr. Redford Williams is a professor of psychology and neurology at Duke University and the author of Anger Kills. He has done extensive research on how anger impacts health. His numerous studies reveal that people who harbor hostility and bitterness increase the risk of many diseases, including heart disease, inflammation, high blood pressure, obesity, high cholesterol, and premature death. Prolonged anger and stress activate many chemical processes in the body and can be very destructive over time. These negative emotions cause elevation of the stress hormone cortisol and increase arterial inflammation and clogging. Does that mean it's never healthy to be angry? No, it's important to deal with conflicts as they arise and to be able to communicate both positive and negative emotions. But holding on to bitterness and resentment without doing anything to resolve the situation is very damaging, not only for your health, but also for your relationships. One definition of mental health is the willingness to deal with pain at all costs. Dealing with conflict can be awkward and embarrassing. Sometimes we want to avoid it altogether, but taking the initiative to be vulnerable 
to apologize and to forgive can profoundly improve our physical and mental health. We live in an imperfect world. We make mistakes and other people do too. Sometimes we are hurt very deeply. Sometimes things happen that are inexcusable. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we weren't hurt or that what happened was okay. It's simply a choice to release the pain and move forward. I want to learn how to love and forgive unconditionally, and I hope you do too. If you're interested in learning how, I recommend the book Forgive to Live by Dr. Dick Tibbetts. Not only do we need to extend forgiveness, but we also need to receive it. In fact, it may be impossible for us to forgive others if we haven't experienced forgiveness ourselves. I remember several times in my past when I made mistakes that hurt other people. The guilt and shame I felt afterwards made me feel bad about myself and about others. What really helped me was to realize that God offers me love and forgiveness no matter what I've done. Experiencing His forgiveness has motivated me to be more forgiving to others. Now I try to forgive people quickly when they hurt me and to ask for forgiveness quickly when I hurt someone else. I believe that forgiveness is the only solution in the universe that's powerful enough to unlock the chemical bonds of anger and bitterness. It's a medicine of greatest importance. Did you know there's a connection between faith and health? Dr. Andrew Newberg is a neuroscientist who specializes in neural theology, the study of spirituality and the brain. He's been scanning patients' brains for over 20 years to discover how spirituality impacts health. His research shows that spiritual practices are inherently good for our bodies, especially our brains. According to Newberg, both meditation and prayer play significant roles in strengthening important circuits in our brains, which make us more socially aware and alert, while reducing anxiety, depression, and neurological stress. A study entitled Religious Involvement in U.S. Adult Mortality found that people who frequently attend religious services live over seven years longer than those who never attend. To put this into perspective, the health benefits of regularly attending religious services is comparable to not smoking. But how does spirituality influence health? Organized religion usually provides a social support system that's been shown to improve overall health. In a study of cardiac surgery patients, people with low social support who did not depend on their religious faith for strength had a mortality rate that was 12 times higher than those who had a strong religious support network to rely on. But do these health benefits come from social support or from God? This question has been asked often enough that a study was conducted to examine it. The study followed 22 kibbutzim, which are close-knit Jewish farming communities. For 16 years, the study compared 11 religious kibbutzim with 11 secular farming communities in Israel. The results were striking. Nearly twice as many people in the secular communities died during the study even when the results were adjusted for age and other social demographic factors. The religious communities had lower mortality rates for all major causes of death. This study suggests that belonging to a religious community may have a stronger health benefit than simply having social support in general. Prayer also has beneficial health effects, especially for the person who is doing the praying. Petitionary prayer, in which a person prays for his or her own health or peace of mind, has been correlated with measurable health improvements. Dr. Tim Jennings is a sought-after psychiatrist and the author of The God-Shaped Brain, How Changing Your View of God Transforms Your Life. In this fascinating book, Dr. Jennings outlines the neurological benefits that come from healthy spirituality. Focusing on a loving God can strengthen the prefrontal cortex of the brain, 
calm the limbic system, reduce anxiety and depression, and give an increased sense of purpose and peace. I believe we are designed to have the physical, emotional, and spiritual domains of our lives in balance. But how can we optimize our spiritual health? I know I really benefit from spending some quiet time each day with God through prayer and Bible study. The more I've gotten to know Him, the more I've discovered that He is a God of love. I believe He created me and that He cares about every aspect of my life, including my health. I also know He cares about you. Many times we try to improve our lives by becoming more healthy, more attractive, or more successful. We crave unconditional love and acceptance and do so many things to achieve it, but at the end of the day, we often feel empty and alone. I believe this is because we were designed for something more. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. I believe there is incredible healing potential in being connected to a loving God in a spiritual community. If you'd like more information about how to grow in this way, visit the Resources tab on our website. I promise these faith-based study guides will be a big blessing on your spiritual journey. The course has come to an end, but your health journey has just begun. My hope and prayer is that the information you've learned will be a big blessing to you. I want to leave you with the same wish that the Apostle John left with his friends when he said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you will prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers.